And I'd like you all to help me give a warm welcome about React State Management in GraphQL era, Kitson. All right, is this thing on? We got to start with some dud jokes like this one and this one. It's a bad joke, I know. So all right, this is a picture of me at React Amsterdam 2016. This was the first conference I attended ever two years ago. I was a React noob, like I was working with React for maybe, I don't know, a couple of months, and I came to the conference. I saw all of these amazing speakers on stage, and I was like, oh my god, they're amazing. And now I'm standing here. So that's like super crazy to me. And I wrote my first Medium article back when I had zero followers. I wrote this. And I sent it to a friend. He was pretty popular in the community. He said, no one will read this crap. And actually, people read that crap. You know, It was fun for them, like a summary of the entire conference. So what point am I making here? Let's talk about three terms, ninja developer, rockstar developer, and senior developer. Like I hate all of them. Ninja developer, let's start with this one. Do you ever see a ninja doing webpack on a roof like at 4 AM? Ninja do, like, they do ninja stuff, right? And then we have senior developer. How, how the hell do you define a senior developer? Like for me, this is the only senior developer that, that can be, right? That's the only one. And then we have the third one, which is like when you're standing on a stage and you usually hear people saying, oh, he's a rock star developer. So I hate this one because this is a rock star, and this is everything but a rock star. All right, there's, there's the difference. And you can hear sometimes he rocked the stage after a talk, but the reality is he read his notes from made on a plane slides, trembling for 30 minutes that people won't figure out that he's a, a fraud. <laughs> so yeah, I'm trying to make a point that if I could make it here to this stage and talk to a lot of conferences, you can make it too. Just try and talk about something that you're passionate about, because at the end of the day, we're all code monkeys trying to make weird libraries work together by writing shitty hacks. Thank you. Thanks. So that being said, Ik Ben Kitze, a rock star senior ninja. All right, I'm kidding. So I'm doing front end open source, and I'm making some products. Lately, I've been focusing for the last year on this project. It's called React Academy IO. So I'm doing training and workshops for all of these technologies and hipster buzzwords that we use. So if you need a workshop, just let me know. Today, we're going to talk about state management in a GraphQL era. Let's start with GraphQL. Like, what is GraphQL? So it's a thing that's eventually going to replace REST, but you keep telling yourself that you don't need to learn it. Like one day, next month, it's on that list that you have with libraries, right? So what is REST? How do we fetch a bunch of data with REST? We got to do all of these API calls, right? If I want to fetch a bunch of data, I got to do all of those calls and then combine the data on the client. So you do the same thing with, with GraphQL by combining it into one query. So actually, you give the power to the client, and the client can say, hey, I need all of this data. So I need specifically this data, and this is really powerful and flexible. So in my opinion, single page apps ruined everything because we were trying to make like a faster car, but we ended up with that contraption, whatever that is. It's not a faster car. So we put everything on the client just to make a single page app. And I think that's really wrong. So before I explain why, let's talk about state management on the client. Why is it complicated, right? We have forms, we have routing, we have inputs. This, these are the small things that define state management on the client. We have tabs, filters, date pickers, menus, checkboxes, blah, blah, blah. But the biggest problem, it's not all the small things. It's data. Data, is, oh, he likes it. So that's the biggest problem that we have on the state management side, all right? Data is, thank you. <laughs> all right. Data is the number one reason why state management is hard. All right, I'm back to this, apparently. Sorry, here he is again. <laughs> and why is that? Because we have data fetching, we have data caching, we have reading, and then we have cache invalidating, which is pain in the ass no matter what you do. So all of these four problems define data on the client. So my first single page app was written in jQuery. That's me writing jQuery code. So I'm not kidding you. It's still used in production. Maybe five years later, it's used by the government. So it's like one main JS file. There's no webpack. There's no imports. There's no build system, nothing. It's main JS, unminified, 3,000 lines of code. You have a bunch of code. You have a calendar plugin right into that file, just saying calendar starts here, code continues here. Like everything is in one file. So it was pretty terrible to write a single page app like that. I mean, it worked, but you don't want to be the guy who is maintaining that hell right now. And we were looking for a solution. Let's fix this jQuery mess and come up with something else for state management. And of course, 
I found out about Angular 1, or nowadays they call it just Angular or something. And it was amazing for me because I liked it. It, it, it made everything simpler, like state management and data fetching, everything. It made sense in my head. Coming from jQuery, it was amazing. Until one day, my roommate said, like, can you explain me that Angular thing because you're really talking about it and I want to get into it, you know? And I sat down, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's just a bunch of factories, and you have services. So you just inject the template. That's a directive, but it's also a factory. And I'm like, what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> like, that's so complicated. And I'm like, no, man, this sounds wrong. We got to move on to something else. So in my company, after a while of doing Angular, we had the choice of doing Angular 2. And then I saw TypeScript, and I decided, now we're going to go with React. So I won't dwell on how good React is. We were at a React conference. It's, yeah, it saved our lives. It's the best, blah, blah, blah. So when I started doing React, of course, I needed to fetch some data, right? So these were my API calls, but I was trying to be too smart. So what I tried to do is I built my own caching mechanism, right? Like these other smarter people didn't figure it out, but I will figure it out on my own. So I made a giant object where I would store, store all of my data by key. So those, that would be the key, and the data would be the value. And that didn't work out well, because after a while, I needed to invalidate the cache. And I was like, oh my god, I, I got myself into a mess. I need some other state management solution so I can put the data in it. And of course, you Google a bit, you end up with this. So I took maybe two weeks off from my work just to learn it and to actually grasp everything around it, all the reducers, all the egghead tutorials and stuff. And I ended up liking it because it was way simpler than just doing set state back, back in the day. And the summary of it is right now I love Redux and I hate Redux. I love it because it's a genius concept. Like if you haven't watched the egghead tutorial where Dan is recreating the library from scratch, it's amazing. You should watch it. Like it's a genius concept. It has some nice ideas. But on the other hand, I hate it because it's a lot of boilerplate to do something, and it's not needed in 90% of the cases. And if you trust me and you feel like, oh, this guy hates Redux, how about the creator of Redux tells you that Redux shouldn't be used, all right? So he's saying here that it's definitely overhyped, low level, and often used unnecessarily. And he literally wrote a blog post that's saying you might not read. Redux. So that's like Metallica releasing an album and, and releasing a blog post, don't listen to our album. It's like amazing how can, he can be critical about the usage of his own library. That's amazing to me. There was this example on Reddit, though. Hello, Reddit. I just started my first React app. What should I use to do my network request? And you won't guess what the first most upvoted answer is. Who says just use Redux Saga? Like, who says just use Redux Saga? No one says just use Redux Saga. That's like your friend is telling you, hey, there's a bug in my house, and you're like, oh, I'll be right there with my bazooka for the bug. That's like such a fucking overkill for state management. And right now, there's a poor soul somewhere trying to connect Redux Saga with Redux form just to make a freaking login form, and it blows my mind. Like, don't use it if it's not needed. This was me explaining Redux to the same roommate. We ran out. We were in a restaurant. And he was like, look, I have this idea for an app. We're going to make an app. Uh, like, we have a company of like 30, 40 people. And everyone does the coffee for, for all of them like every day or brings coffee. So I want to make a, uh, an app that's going to shuffle all the names. It's going to pop out one name. And that person is going to do the coffee that day. And he's like, let's write an app on, about it. Yeah, we're going to start up. It's amazing. <laughs> and we were just joking around. Let's write the app. And he's like, OK, index.html, one main JS file. We include jQuery. We're done by the end of the day. I'm like, no, no, no. We need Redux. I'm going to teach you React and Redux and Webpack and all of these amazing things. And he's just sitting there, and I'm talking for two hours about how we can push a value into an array, but we need four files and a reducer. And the restaurant closed. Even the waiters were like, what the fuck is going on in that code? That's terrible. And he got pretty turned off by the entire idea of like, using five files to do one thing. And I said, look, it really looks complicated for simple apps. Maybe I should try this other thing. I heard about it at React Amsterdam two years ago. And it was MobX. So it was pretty great. I went home that night. I learned MobX. It's pretty simple. Reactive programming, observables, and stuff. And I liked it. Ever since then, in most of my apps, I have MobX included. It doesn't matter if I have GraphQL or don't. I like this solution better. The point is, what is better? Because we have these battles like since the dawn of time, like jQuery versus MooTools, Angular versus M, GraphQL versus REST, Redux versus MobX, React versus Vue, Apollo versus Relay, and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of these battles, right? The mistake we're doing about all of them, including the last one, is asking what's better instead of what's suitable for my app, what's suitable for my team, and what's suitable for our use case. Because asking what's better, it's really wrong. In my opinion, I think that Trump is great but on a golf course. So it's all about, he's terrible as a president, right? It's all about the context of the thing. You cannot say this is better. And what we have in our community lately, we have this, higher component suck. 
On the other hand, we have random props are everything. Why can't we as a community just find the middle and be like, how about a healthy mix? Sometimes use higher order components, sometimes use render props, but just don't say that one thing is the worst and one thing is the best. It's all about the context. Then we had the same thing previously. Everyone was like, up until a few months ago, we need Redux for everything. And then you see blog posts like Redux is dead. So we can just replace it with context. No, you idiots, you cannot replace it with context because Redux is using context. So this is really wrong. Like, you can replace a portion of it by using the new context API. You cannot just replace Redux. It's a huge library. So my point is, find a healthy mix. Use Redux if you need it. Don't use it if you don't need it. So let's see data fetching examples. We have fetch, which is the simplest API. We have five lines here to just fetch some data. Then we have Redux. I need a couple of slides. So I need an async action in order to fetch my to-dos. I'm dispatching a bunch of things. But then I need to handle those actions. So I have a reducer. I have to do something with the data, handle all of the actions that are going to come. And on the next slide, we have the same thing in MobX. We have one slide. We have a class, observables, decorators, a lot of things going on. But it would be simpler with GraphQL. So if we see an example using Apollo on the client, to just fetch something from GraphQL. We can fit on one slide, we can fit the component plus the query. And that was amazing to me when, when I saw like, OK, this component can just describe what does it need. And it's, it's coupled together right in the same component. It was amazing because I don't have to do this call with Redux or MobX or whatever else in the background. This is pretty good. Um, the problem here is we were fixing the sync instead of fixing the well, instead of fixing the root of the problem. So the sync would be we were, sing, uh, we were fixing state management. And actually, we needed to fix like REST APIs. We needed to get rid of them and replace them with something better. And that, the effect of that would be fixing state management on the client. So this was state management as we described it previously, right? Data was the big problem. And now, if we remove data, he's going to be sad about it, but we're left with a bunch of small things for data. Now we can tackle this in like whichever way we want. It's really simple to solve this. There's no more caching and validating all of that stuff we were doing. So, an example of moving to GraphQL this is my favorite example. I just show it everywhere. But when they moved from Redux to GraphQL, they removed around 5,000 lines of code. Like all of their, they, they kept using Redux, but they removed all the data fetching, caching, and validating logic, and they removed around 5,000 lines. That's amazing. So you're going to ask me the topic of the talk is, do we even need a state management library when using GraphQL? And my answer to everyone always is like, ah, I don't know. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't need it. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of a stack that you could use, and then you decide at, at the end of the talk, am I going to use it or am I not going to use it? So we have vanilla, a head for, OK, I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to start with the first one. The first one is you can just use a client-side li library like Apollo or Relay, and you can use a router and set state. And that's going to be enough in most of the cases. You don't need to include Redux or MobX or anything external. Second one would be if you have like really complicated forms, like a form in a nested form in a nested form or something, then you can just grab a form library. You have formic, you have final form, you have a bunch of them. You don't have to install MobX or Redux just to handle forms, right? You can just install a form library. Then if you have like, if you want to support offline queries and stuff like that, you can just plug in specifically for Apollo. You can just plug in Apollo Cache Persist and you'll get offline out of the box for the queries. So you don't have to do it manually anymore. And then we have, I want to go home early, which is Apollo, MobX, MobX React 4, MobX Router. So why do I call it I want to go home early? Because I remember this tweet from Michel, the guy who created uh, MobX. He said, um, MobX doesn't try to prove an academic point. It just wants you to go home early. But my advice is, if you're paid by the hour, stick with Redux. You don't want to go home early. <laughs> and I, I like this stack. I, I'm using it a lot. And then we have next level. We're going to use server-side rendering. And probably you're not going to lead, need something for global state management on the client. I like Next.js for this example. And now let me blow your mind by suggesting you this. And people are going to be like, there's no way we can do that. How about you use full page reloads when navigating between routes? It makes you uncomfortable, right? You like your single page app because it's, oh, it's instant. When I click, it's instant. But if you go to Amazon, Airbnb, a lot of these like, huge apps, they're not single page apps. None of them is. You click, and you wait a little bit. It's a full page reload, and it goes to the other page. And those pages are there like mini apps. So this is a valuable approach, because you don't have like a mega client side app. You have a bunch of smaller apps. And it would look something like this. So for every route, or no matter how you decide to split your logic, you're going to have a smaller app. And that's more maintainable than the single page app that's huge. You can also use only Apollo. 
they release this Apollo link state, so you can have client-side schema. So then your GraphQL library can also handle server queries, but also client-side stuff. So for example, if my to-dos component needs to know about the counter that's on the client side, I can just include it in my server query. So I can grab some things from the server. I can grab some things from the client. But the beauty of this is my component will, exa will describe exactly what it needs. Like, here's what I need from the server. Here's what I need from the client side state. And that's everything that's going to go into this component. This is nice. So when using GraphQL, in 90% of the cases, you won't need Redux or MobX or Sagas or Observables or RxJS or whatever you're using. If you still want to use it, it's your thing. So that's the next point I'm going to make after this slide. Who am I to tell you what to do? Or who is any speaker that gets on stage? And why would you listen to us? Specifically for my example, like you should know more about my context and how I work before you follow my advice about GraphQL or anything else. So let me tell you something about myself. I work alone. I'm doing the workshop things. I don't work for clients. I don't know what I'm doing, basically. I'm experimenting with a new library every week. And I, I'm going to make a Christmas tree out of this slide. Like, who, who does that? <laughs> and you're listening to me, right? <laughs> All right, thanks. So before you follow someone else's advice, whether it's a speaker, whether you see someone on Twitter, on GitHub, whatever, you should evaluate the context and your situation, and specifically what you and your team are working on before you just blindly follow someone else's advice. Uh, there is a client project story that I have for you before I jump to this slide. Um, we, were, we just started working with Apollo. It was, I don't know, two years ago maybe. We just started working with Apollo, not two years ago. One, it doesn't matter. We started with Apollo, and I read all the docs, and it held, like, the docs are huge. You got to make, like, optimistic updates. You got to handle the cache perfectly. You got to handle a lot of stuff. And I'm like, this client has an MVP, and their idea is going to change. Like, from week to week, they want a new thing. You know startups. Every week, they're coming up with a new way to shake up the world. So they were like, we need to change this. We need to change that. And I'm like, if we go all in on making our code perfect, like making our GraphQL, our Apollo, and everything works perfectly, we're never, this team is never going to make it because we're going to go crazy. They're changing requirements every week. So let's do the minimum job that we can do. And instead of handling the cache and stuff, every time there's a mutation, like every time a user is clicking like on something or is creating something new, let's just refetch all the ac active queries that are on the page right now. And to some people, you may be like, ew, you're going to refetch data. But that data was like less than a kilobyte sometimes. It's like really small queries. And it made it worth it because our team was more productive, not thinking about how we're going to handle the cache. Our responses from the server were instant. And we didn't bother. We could change requirements every week without a problem because we were only caring about what should we fetch, not how should we cache it. And we just refetched the data. So the point is, don't be scared of the network. Sometimes few kilobytes of extra data that you're going to get are better than your team spending weeks on over over engineering and making everything perfect. That thing is going to change anyway, so just take it step by step. I used to over engineer things, and now I'm trying to focus on the idea can I make my user happy? Because if you want to make yourself happy as a developer during your workday, oh man, that's so easy. Like you can get up in the morning, learn what is Redux Saga, Redux Form, connect the two, work for eight freaking hours to make a logging form. Then when you go home, you'll be like, oh, I feel amazing. I learned these two new things. But your user is going to log in and he's going to be like, okay, I can log in. So you should see from the user side, what did I do for this user today, not what did I do for my developer satisfaction. I feel like a genius because I made two libraries work together. So just think about the user a little bit. Um, raise your hand if this was you in some situation. I made something. It works, and I think it's awesome, but I'm not sure if it's right. Right? Everyone, literally everyone. So we're looking for external approval. Oh, I made this, but I'm not sure what other people think about it. That's why we have Twitter, right? But what is right? Guys, we're putting HTML and CSS into our JavaScript. We, like, have you seen JSX? What is, what is, have you seen WebAssembly? Like, people are, are messing around with stuff all the time. And that's why I, I'm starting to feel better and better about my code. I'm like, none of the other guys know what they're doing. Why should I care, right? So stop seeking that external approval for everything that you do. I have this example. This guy, this friend I have made something with the React Router. He made something cool, like asynchronously Preloading, when you go to a route, it's finding all the link, it's preloading, like it's something really cool, and his app seemed instant. I asked him why he didn't know why, he just made it. I'm like, that's amazing. He's like, yeah, it's amazing, it works for me, it works for our team, but I'm not sure if it's right. And 
what is right in the case. If it works for you, if it works for your team, that's it's right. This is connected to everything I talk about GraphQL. If it works for you and your team, then it's right. Just don't seek the external approval. Like, if you believe me, I haven't used React Router 4 or 3 or whatever they had after 2. Because when I started with MobX, I just built my own MobX router that's been pretty fine for all of my apps. And I don't know how to write anything with React Router 4. And I'm doing React workshops, right? And I don't feel bad about it because MobX router, the thing that I wrote, is pretty simple, it's pretty small, but it's satisfying my needs. So I don't feel that fear of missing out what does the React Router API do. I have this other example about learning new technologies. If you know Nomadlist, the site, it's written in PHP, vanilla PHP, no frameworks, and jQuery. So they don't have GraphQL, they don't have fancy state management. It's literally PHP and jQuery. And the interesting part is he's making around, I don't know, twenty to $50,000 per month like the sum of all of us here, with PHP and jQuery. And his brother started to learn development like at the same time. And this guy, the PHP and jQuery guy, was like, I'm going to learn something just to make my users happy and to build a platform. And his brother was like, no, no, no I'm going to learn Meteor. And at the end of the day, after a couple of months, the one guy was rich, the other guy knew Meteor. So that was the difference. <laughs> he was thinking of the users. Another example. This same router friend, we were talking a lot about GraphQL, and he's like, man, we took our GraphQL stack to the next level. Now we have like uh, one caching layer on the server side, and we have Apollo Engine integrated. We have a lot of things. And on the client, it's super fast. It's like microseconds for responses. I'm like, OK, were you building the new Facebook? What the hell were you doing that you needed such a fast web, such a fast API? He said, oh, we're just doing a landing page for hospital. Like, there's not going to be a case when the nurse says, doctor, we're losing him. Our landing page is not fast enough. Like, don't over-engineer over every freaking thing that you touch. So you shouldn't feel bad. Like, I don't want you to feel bad after this talk that you sh you're not using GraphQL, you're using um, REST. And I have an awesome point. Sarah, that was doing the website for React Fast, <laughs> uh, no, first raise your hand if you haven't manually written a service worker or you don't, know, don't have any idea what they're doing. Right? I haven't written one from scratch. I know the one in Create React App that I always delete. Like you generate a project with Create React App and you delete the service worker. But I don't feel bad about using it because Sierra made a landing page with a service worker. And it turns out a lot of people visited the page. And after, after that, the service worker was like, it, it had all the data cached. And they couldn't update the landing page anymore for their users. So they had to buy a new domain just so they can redirect users to the new domain because of the service worker. My point is, if you're using the latest and greatest, GraphQL in this case, it doesn't mean that you're not going to bump up into any problems. To sum up the last part, stop seeking external approval. Stop seeking answers in other people's projects. Sometimes it's great to look into other people's projects, but don't do it for everything. Stop feeling insecure about your code, because nobody actually knows what they're doing. And the last one is hard, but you've got to delete your Twitter account. If you like what you're doing with your team, with your stack, whatever, just forget about this talk and you can move on. If you want to talk to me about these things, you can find me online at kitsia.io and kitsia on GitHub and kitsia on Medium. Some assholes told kitsia on Twitter. He tweeted once and he takes the account. So I'm the kitsia on Twitter. And Bedank and Totsis, thank you for listening. Thanks.